most important things you feel like a community or a city needs when they have disaster is water, food, medical attention, and housing. And they do. But I know from my personal experience that they would give up all those things to have one thing. To know where their family is at. To know if their family is living or dead. Because most of the time, when it has a disaster, they don't let the people of that community that's been devastated take part in the rebuilding. That's a huge problem. The UW Nola project evolved out of an interest I had in environmental justice. The concept of environmental justice is that uh, people of all income and races should have equal access, equal protection under the environmental laws of the country. And yet the actual practice is that communities with fewer resources don't have the same access to that fair treatment. The Lower Ninth Ward and Pam DeShiel, who was the president of the Holy Cross Neighborhood Association, definitely felt that their neighborhood was an environmental justice community. So they had uh, this priority of restoring their wetland. Uh, we had a water resource management practicum, and so uh, here we had a match between the educational goals of the practicum and a community that had a problem that could be our client. Right after the, the uh, levee breaks in December of 2005, Holy Cross Neighborhood Association began meeting weekly. And we started with rolling meetings that would last three hours and to bring in as many people as possible from the Lower Ninth Ward. Up until January of this year, um, Holy Cross Neighborhood Association continued meeting weekly. And it's a forum in exchange for information and ideas, a chance to um, address our representation. Well, I've never been so 
humiliated and felt so helpless in my life. I was one of the first responders back, and my thing was I just wanted to see my house to make sure it wasn't one of the ones I saw on TV floating. So, so when I came back, I wanted to just see my house. And uh, yeah, I came to the St. Claude Bridge to come over here, and uh, I had my ID, I had my driver's license, and I told the National Guard, I, I just, I just want to get closure. I want to just see if my house still standing, you know, whatever that is. And he said, you can't do that. Well, I, I didn't know how to deal with that. For five months, I was numb. I could have this conversation with you and two minutes later, I couldn't tell you a word I said. I was hoping this was a bad dream. But every day I woke up, it kept getting worse. Till I finally decided to get up and fight. Every person that we interviewed at every level references Katrina because Katrina really uh, was such a huge disaster that it's a new set point for everyone's life. No matter if you're on the, the higher end of town in the Garden District or if you're in the Lower Ninth Ward. Um, what we saw, of course, was that the people in the Lower Ninth Ward had less resources going into this. The Lower Nine specifically, and another reason that it took a lot of attention um, I don't think people realize this up front, but those properties have been deeded back when the deeds were written in French. And so when the groups came in to help these people to get their road home money, they had no proof that they owned these homes. So once again, we're dealing with a, a socioeconomic population that couldn't go sit at an attorney's office and trying to prove that they were actually the true heir that it didn't go to the three siblings according to general law. There's literature that's developed since Katrina uh, about how environmental hazards also are a manifestation of environmental injustice. Uh, and so one sees that the breaching of the levees in the Lower Ninth Ward is an example where the environmental hazard of a hurricane impacted the Lower Ninth Ward a low-income minority community more than in other parts of the city. Now, there is a faction uh, that will argue that one shouldn't live on land that's eight feet below sea level. And, and I will say that a rational side of me can go along with that um, argument. But when you experience the vibrancy of the history and the culture of the people who live in the Lower Ninth Ward, and I compare it with other communities that have equally poor reasons for being sited where they are, such as Las Vegas in the middle of the desert. Why should one community be built in non-natural circumstances and another told you shouldn't exist? With this five-year uh, anniversary of Katrina, there are city officials who felt that they were not going to be giving any priority to rebuilding in the Lower Ninth Ward. I've been living here all my life, down here in the Ninth Ward, across the canal. and. Um, well, it's been pretty hectic during Katrina. I was here during Katrina. I saw how high the water was. I was standing on my porch, and it's like we got 13 feet of water beneath us. That's, it, it didn't feel right. I know it didn't feel right. Because anyway, how could this water come through? They had to let the water in. They had to. It's not that just that the water just came through like that. It couldn't have overflowed because they didn't even have enough water on the other side of the bridge. On this side of the bridge, it was full. That's what I, that's what I, I failed to understand. I think what, what I didn't understand being from uh, Wisconsin and the northern part of the country um, is 
how few resources actually trickled down to the community members, for example, in the Lower Ninth Ward. Um, there was a lot of money donated. Um, there was a lot of money um, that FEMA came through. And what the community members tell us is there's failures at every level of government. Um, but beyond that, I, I think this disaster response was not uh, sensitive to this community in particular. I've heard when I, when, when I first came back, a lot of the volunteers said, well, well why, you, why you stay there? You know it's going to flood. Because our media don't tell them the truth. The Lower Ninth Ward never, ever floods unless the levees break. You fix the levees properly, we never ever flood. 1965, Betsy, the government admitted blowing the levees to take the pressure off the city, keep the city from flooding. In 1929 or 27, they admitted doing it, but they didn't do it in 05. Blame doesn't solve anything. The facts still remain that if the levees was fixed properly, we would have been sitting here talking right now. There was um, some speculation and some evidence that the levees were bombed in uh, the 1927 floods so that it wouldn't flood the downtown area. And then, of course, uh, where the levees were bombed, that flooded the, the neighborhoods there. So there is a long history of government not coming through for this population in particular. We didn't have a system in place for evacuation. We didn't have a system in place to actually bring the people back, and we still don't. It's really totally unacceptable, you know, to have people on rooftops four and five days with no water, no food, or anything in the greatest country in the world. That's not going to change until we change it. If they have another Katrina today or tomorrow, basically the same thing would happen. Cleaning the streets. How, how many degrees you need to clean the streets? What if we could have cleaned up by community? You see, because now we depended on the government for his femur, the road home that I call the road away from home. Where do you think we would be today? We would be at least 95%, uh, 98% back. If we would use a system similar to that, then people take ownership of their community because they are part of the rebuilding. I think the thing that struck me first and is an experiential aspect to actually visiting the city is how the wetlands are eight feet above ground level. The way you see a wetland in New Orleans is you climb up over a flood wall uh, in order to see it. So. The, um, the wetlands, which serve as hurricane protection for the neighborhood, are hidden from view because of the flood wall. The Mississippi River is one of the largest rivers in the world. It drains 40% of the United States. For the, New, the city of New Orleans to establish itself, it needed to cut itself off from the seasonal flooding of the Mississippi River. As the city grew up, they started constructing levees all up and down the Mississippi River, not just in New Orleans. But so essentially, the Mississippi River is only allowed to flood in a few places along, along its entire course. So what that means for the city of New Orleans is that it doesn't get any new, any new sediment, so no land is being rebuilt. And so that land, what would be a land building material for places like New Orleans and I'm sure other, other areas along the city is now just being dumped over the continental shelf and you know going into the abyss. 
The Bayou Bienvenue is a wetland that's adjacent to the Lower Ninth Ward. And when the Lower Ninth Ward was first developed, um, it, it actually was a place where people would hunt and fish and, and retain a lot of their sustenance from the wetlands. It was a real integral part of the community. Then, um, because of the, the flooding and the, the hurricanes, a flood wall was built in the 60s, and it's a 12-foot flood wall, which separated the, the people of the Lower Ninth Ward from the wetlands. And as a result, um, residents who were born after the 60s or who have moved there since the 60s um, aren't, aren't really aware that there's a resource for them that's right, right in their neighborhood. Recently, um, the University of Colorado has built a platform over that 12-foot iron flood wall so that residents can access the, the wetlands again. One has to be struck that when you do climb over that flood wall that you realize how close you are to downtown New Orleans. It can be a symbol of the need for coastal restoration uh, throughout the, the Gulf region. The Bayou Bienvenue Wetland Triangle today is open water that's two feet deep um, where uh, the water is deepest and you see cypress stumps uh, that represent what used to be a healthy cypress forest. It is very striking to look at aerial photographs uh, from the 1930s up to the present in which you can see that the uh, entire uh, Bayou Bienvenue Wetland Triangle, which is approximately 440 acres, is uh, a healthy cypress swamp. The Mississippi River in this area down here is actually one of the biggest shipping ports in the United States. It's also one of the biggest oil and natural gas producing areas in the United States and so there's a lot of economic um, incentive around here to, to destroy the wetlands and that's a lot of the large-scale wetland loss has been caused from canals that have been that have been dredged for shipping and for oil and gas and things like that. This area has been changed by those, those canals as well, like Mr. Go is a shipping canal. And this area is also one of the most urban wetlands that the city of New Orleans has to offer. One of the post-Katrina occurrences was the flooding from the Murphy oil refinery that caused a lot of concern about pollution mixed in with the floodwaters. You look at the number of polluting entities that surround a community, and one of the things that is somewhat hidden from neighborhood view but is right there in the wetland is the East Bank Sewage Treatment Plant. And so this is what in the environmental justice literature is termed a locally unwanted land use. If you don't have the, the city, or the, the trees, the wood, the soil, the water, all those things are hooked together to make the oil. If you don't have this, something going to go wrong. You know, and people just forget, you know, everybody have fun, but this is not nothing to play with. The, envir the environment is serious. Everybody all over the world is thinking about the environment way more than they used to. So it's time for us to get serious, put together, enjoy the environment, and protect the environment. Stop throwing plastics everywhere. Sure, it was made with good intentions, but when you throw it in the wrong spot, then it's a bad intention. It's a net. 
and all the weaving of this net ends up one piece of thread when you take it loose, <laughs> you know. So all this is just one. I mean, it's weaved in different direction, and it looks like it's a different thing, but if you take this piece of string and you weave it into a net, it looks like something different. But if you take the net or loose, it's still one long strand of string. When you join the str strand of string together, then you got unification. As long as it's not joined together, it's just a big long strand of string. Yes, it's time for a cohesive movement of all people of race, color and creed, nationality and sex to come together and make this thing happen. We can do it. Okay, we got the resilience. We got the uh, ability to move this thing forward. BP has stated their two priorities initially were to stop the spill and to reduce the amount of oil that made it to the shore and the wetlands. We're 60 days out, the spill is still going on. So we can't get our arms around the total destruction because it's still leaking and still adding to what's going on in the Gulf and the estuaries. And their second one was to decrease what came in shore. One of the really big faults was that they didn't contain the crude oil offshore. They didn't clean it up before it made it onshore into the wetlands and beaches. And now we're gonna to have to deal with this forever and ever. This has been a very, very difficult situation. Working with the community, trying to get them educated, working with the agencies, trying to keep abreast of what's going on and provide information as the voice of the fishing community to the agencies, providing input to the agencies about where the health impacts are being experienced, where there's a need for air monitoring, water monitoring, set of monitoring. BP is using two dispersants, Core Exit 9500 and 9527, and they're using it one on the slick near the wellhead site and the dispersant actually moves it from the surface slick into the entire water column and into the bottom. So it's killing all the organisms in the water column and the benthic organisms in the bottom. And then it moves inshore. It moves inshore as a dispersed column. It also moves inshore as a slick. You see the slick. So when the slick comes into the wetland areas and marshes, it contaminates all the vegetation. And after a short period of time, the vegetation starts dying. It contaminates and kills the fish, the crabs, the crustaceans. But what happens when the vegetation dies, the next strong weather front, the vegetation will not be there to hold the sediment together. And the sediment will start eroding. And we already have the loss of a football field of wetlands every 30 minutes. The dispersants have a large number of short-term health impacts and long-term health impacts. The short term or the acute is like the respiratory problems, the headaches, the nausea, chest pains. The long term issues both with the dispersant and with the crude oil do a lot of cardiovascular damage, a lot of lung, heart disease. And it is added to people who already have pre-existing conditions. It decreases the lung volume so then it has an impact not only on the lung, but on the heart. So that the chronic illnesses will be there and just degrade the health of these fishing communities that are being exposed to both the crude and the dispersion for many, many years in the future. So that's another portion is that even if we can reestablish a mechanism for them earning a living, a lot of them are gonna be so ill, they're not gonna be able to retain a job because of their health issues. The future of this community depends on how many generations the wetlands and the fisheries resources and the crustaceans 
take to come back so that they will have the opportunity to go out and harvest again. Even when they start coming back, the chemical contamination from the crude will bioaccumulate up into the organism. So it's going to contaminate the fish and seafood for a very, very long time. The research that they had in the material safety data sheet for the dispersants themselves just showed toxicity to aquatic organisms because you were applying the dispersant to an aquatic environment. And clearly it was a few toxicity tests on aquatic species in the marine environment. Little to no toxicity on human health. The community is left out of the process. The Coast Guard is head of the command center, Mineral Management Service and EPA serve in the advisory capacity at the control centers. But yet BP is primarily making the decisions and BP is making the decisions and the federal agencies are either yes or no and most of the time they're saying yes. When you come into the communities and you start having a workshop and explain it to them in terms they can understand about what's going on and what decisions have been made, the community is just appalled. These fishers go like, well, why weren't we asked? Why weren't we consulted? Why aren't we part of that process? The technology for cleanup of oil spills has not progressed like the technology for drilling and production. There's a desperate need to increase and improve that technology so that the next time anything like this happens, it can be addressed offshore before it gets onshore. I really believe that uh, BP is responsible and they should make our people whole. They've closed down some of the most fertile fishing areas in the United States, namely Barataria Bay, Caminata Bay, the Gulf of Mexico, and all of our marshes. Uh, our people cannot fish. We can't even fish on our own property. I can't walk out from my house on Caminata Bay and throw a line. It's illegal. disaster we handle it like war. We have the same mindset as war. Why do you think we was called refugees? I never thought about that before. But we may have been called refugees because it's a mindset of the army and how they operate. Things are not important. People are. I was hugely wrong about people. People care. They just didn't know what to do. People are still coming today, almost five years after the fact, because they care. There's been incredible work to bring this community back and to bring it together. So many, many groups and volunteers and individuals and institutions and churches and corporate folks. It's just been amazing, but the the nexus and the hub of it is our neighbors, the people here in this community helping themselves and pushing forward no matter what. So the community in its recovery process, since Katrina said, well, it's no good if we just recover and rebuild our homes, we need to rebuild the, the, the bayou. So this is sort of a test plot we're doing today. We've got University of Wisconsin students, uh, and a company called Floating Island. We're going to put these islands out in the water and with wetland plants that were donated by a couple of nonprofits here, uh, Common Ground and uh, Bayou Rebirth. We're going to be the eyes and ears for the program, and we came out today, and some of the students and instructors have come out for the actual launching. And uh, we're concerned because this is our neighborhood, and we're trying to get our buffer zone back because actually I've experienced. Uh, not only Katrina, but in 65, uh, Betsy. So we know the wetlands, the essentials, the values of it, and it's time to get uh, everything back online where uh, the world is a safer place. 
And so we're hoping that this can be a model for other people to, and ways to bring back Cyprus, to get the community involved in restoration and find out how they can work with it in the future and also really environmental education so that, you know, the younger people and the older people know the importance of, of having a healthy environment in their area. I think anytime you have a disaster, the biggest mistake we make is not allowing the, the, the communities to be a part of the, the healing. Pay them that money. Then you're not waiting and begging for people to do something right. We need to take part in that. We need to definitely make that a part of disaster relief. My hope is that there is some system developed to recognize that some populations are affected differently and that there's more resources made available after disasters to help those areas rebuild. Um, and I, my hope is that the, the Bayou Bien Venue Triangle can become part of that restoration, that that will bring resources into the community so that people can begin to work in that restoration project. Other people who are coming to see it will bring resources to the Lower Ninth Ward. So that would be one of the best outcomes from this project. My goal has always been from the educational side. The opportunity to work with the students, their enthusiasm, their talent, their initiative uh, it has been rewarding and, and I think it's the students have had an impact on the community uh, hopes for restoring the wetland going into the future. Nothing can help a move faster than people can about people. It, it, nothing. No government or anything. I strongly believe in volunteers now. 75% of the work that's been done in New Orleans has been done by volunteers. You know that's going to be a part of it. Anytime you have disaster, you're going to have people that care about people and they're going to come in to help. So with that, how much you think it would cost us individually? It'll be way less than a dollar. And you could probably, depending on the disaster, a penny. A penny could probably clear up most disasters. So if it's that simple and that cheap, why well, we don't do it?